it's a beautiful Sunday, and Sunday means that the uh, Hunley Museum is open. Hunley Museum doesn't stay open very much. It's uh, mostly a weekend thing. I'm going to flip you around so you can see the uh, Warren Lash Conservation Center, home of the USS, excuse me, home of the CSS. Boy, the uh, Confederate Navy would be upset if they heard me say that. The CSS, Confederate Submarine Ship Hunley. Here it is. That's it, the Warren Lash Conservation Center. Um, and we're gonna go in there and we're gonna actually see the Hunley, which was discovered 130 years after it sank at the bottom of the Charleston Harbor after sinking the Union ship, the Houstonic and uh, disappeared for 130 years, discovered in two, uh, correction, discovered in 1995, um, sat on the bottom for about five years, and then it was raised in 2000 and brought here for conservation efforts. A tour eclectic special, and kind of a spur of the moment. The Hunley Museum. Hunley Museum at Charleston, South Carolina. We're going to go over it real quick. Um, I'll, I'll be turning the Osmo Pocket on and off a lot during this uh, tour to make sure that I document the proper order of things, if you will. Look at this uh, in order, uh, for lack of a better term. So here we go, the Hunley Museum. So we're entering the Hunley Museum. Uh, the Hunley, if you didn't know, was a Confederate submarine used in uh, the Civil War, the war between the states. Uh, it was used in 1863, and it disappeared and was not located again for many, many years, uh, resting at the bottom of the Charleston Harbor. Um, over here we have a replica prop from the movie The Hunley and um, as you enter the crew commitment to feel what it was like on The Hunley, remember this replica used is 10% larger, larger than the actual submarine. Um, and you'll see it's wide open too because uh, they needed to put cameras and stuff. So when you think about this thing being 10% larger than the real submarine, You'll get an idea of how small the actual submarine was. Um, here are the holes that they were discussing that are drilled in the side to allow the cameras to go through. Over here is a model of the Hunley with uh, scale figures in it. You can see how tight they would have been in this uh, machine. Uh, there's certainly no room to stand and uh, no room actually even to sit up straight. They're going to be hunched over that hand crank, which is propelling the propeller. Um, believe it or not, they tried initially to do a, a early version of an electric motor, um, not on the Hunley, but on one of its predecessors, and they just couldn't generate enough power. So the Hunley was expanded, uh, lengthened to put in additional crewmen, and as we see these gentlemen are working the hand crank seven men and a uh, operator dash commander up there in the uh, conning tower this is documenting some of the earlier attempts uh, if you remember the south was being blockaded by the north um, the, the navy of the uh, union was basically sealing off, they were trying to strangle uh, the South from getting supplies. And the South was desperate to uh, break that blockade. And the Hunley was designed to do just that. This is talking about her um, early missions. Uh, you see first and second crew. That's because here in October 15th, uh, 1863, the Hunley was uh, being tested and it sank and Horace Hunley, the designer of the submarine, 
uh, perished on that mission. Then again, here we see the uh, final crew. Um, two tragedies have now befallen the Hunley. Once again, the ship was raised and repaired. General Beauregard pulled support for the project, claiming it was more dangerous to the Confederates than the enemy. A young na man named George Dixon, who helped build the Hunley and followed her to Charleston from Mobile, convinced Beauregard to give them the submarine one more chance, this time with him at the helm. With the dangers of the submarine well known, a new courageous volunteer crew was selected and put under the command of Lieutenant Dixon. Soon the vessel would be ready to carry out its mission. This section called a work in progress. H.L. Hunley's engineers were always on the watch for ways to improve the operation and effectiveness of the submarine. The rudder, um, commanded, uh, controlled by a joystick, the hatches, conning towers, each Hunley was, uh, the Hunley was equipped with two conning towers, each with viewing ports, which enabled the captain to observe the ship's surrounding ballast tanks, hull plates, dive planes. So you get the idea. The Hunley was the first submarine to actually sink a ship in combat. Unfortunately, after that, she disappeared too. So down here, we can kind of see uh, the attack. Yeah. Finally, on sep uh, February 17, 1864, a break in the weather gave Dixon a chance. He had his sights set on the USS Houstonic, a sloop of war anchored nearby, four miles off Sullivan's Island. It was the closest blockader in the fleet. At about 8.45 p.m., several sailors on the deck of the Houstonic reported seeing something on the water just a few hundred feet away. The officer of the deck thought it might be a porpoise. Um, coming up to blow as the object approached the ship, this crew realized it was no porpoise. The alarm sounded, the sailors fired their guns, bullets pinging off the metal hull at the Hunley. Below the surface, the submarine rammed her long metal spar in the Houston tonic, igniting an approximately 135 pound torpedo in the sloop side. Detonation. The men aboard the warship said the explosion sounded very much like the collision with another vessel. The explosion had blown a hole 10 feet wide in the ship. It sank in less than five minutes. The sloop lost five of its 160 crewmen. The blue light. Nearly 45 minutes later, a Union sailor claimed he saw a blue light on the water. Some speculate this was the last reported sighting of the Hunley. For more than a century, according to some historical accounts, Dixon had promised the troops at Battery Marshall that if successful, he would signal to shore by showing two blue lights. The Confederates on Sullivan's Island say they saw the agreed-upon signal and lit a fire to guide the Hunley home, but she never returned and vanished without a trace, her fate remaining a mystery for more than 130 years. Here we see a diagram, or I should say a model, of the Hunley. Here's its long spar with an arrowhead and attached to the actual submarine. So it would ram this spar into the enemy vehicle, into the enemy vessel, I should say, and then back away, uh, leaving this section uh, stuck in the bottom of the the victim ship. Here's a map of uh, exactly what happened. We're currently right up here in the uh, Cooper River at the old uh, Charleston Naval Base uh, shipyard. Uh, here's Charleston proper, uh, Fort Sumter, Battery Wagner, and up here we have Breach Inlet. So we have Sullivan's Island, here and then Isle of Palms. Breach Inlet is the inlet that goes between the two. Houstonic was down here. The Hunley leaves, attacks the Houstonic, and was believed to have disappeared in this direction. There's our map of events. February of 1864. Theories about what sunk the Hunley. 
The first one I had ever heard of was a lucky shot. Once the Hunley was spotted by the Houston Tonic, the sailors began firing down on the summary. It's possible one of these shots struck Lieutenant Dixon. The only viewport missing on the vessel is the one forward in the forward counting tower where Dixon was stationed. Scientists on the project confirmed this damage occurred early, possibly even on the night of the mission. However, Lieutenant Dixon's remains give no indication of gunshot wound as possible. The shot only impacted soft tissue, but no bullet was found in the submarine. Collision at sea, the Houstonic sank in shallow waters and many of her crew climbed into the rigging to await rescue. First on the scene was the USS, I can't pronounce that. Kentatwanga. One survivor testified he saw the Kentatwanga headed toward a blue light on the water. Such an impact could have afflicted deadly damage to the Hunley. Interesting, the Hunley's rudder was found beneath the submarine during recover. recovery, leading scientists to speculate it may have been sheared off before it sank. The activity from the ships arriving may have created a swell that swamped the Hunley. Trapped by the tides, powering a 40-foot uh, submarine several miles out to sea is hard work. To make the trip a little easier on the crew, the mission was timed with the tides. After the sinking of Houston, the Hunley may have dropped to the sea floor to wait for the tide to change to avoid uh, both being pulled out further to sea and uh, detection by Union vessels coming in to aid the Houston survivors. It's possible the crew misjudged their oxygen supply were waiting and somehow become stuck in the seabed, causing them to die of asphyxiation. Additionally, the cold from pushing through the region producing the storm system around the time of the attack, which would have made the return trip much more difficult. And then the last theory here, torpedo takes out the Hunley. One of the most popular theories is that the Hunley was simply too close to the Houston Tonic when its torpedo detonated, resulting in damage which allowed water to come rushing in, drowning the crew, or causing them some sort of continued physical harm, such as concussion. This theory was initially supported by the, the holes found on the Hunley when she was recovered. Further research determined that many, but not all, of these openings were caused by years of wear and tear and ocean tides by anything occurring uh, than anything occurring that night. Still, recent discoveries show the Hunley was much closer to the torpedo when it detonated than originally thought, perhaps as close as 20 feet. And if we know anything about modern depth charges, that would certainly um, rupture the hulls of uh, the uh, plates of a uh, vessel that looks like this. Um, this little mock-up is actually where people can go in and crank the Hunley to turn the propeller is back here still. Ah, the digital propeller. I like it. As a former submariner, I've been asked on a couple occasions on what I think happened to the crew of the Hunley. And I think they died of asphyxiation. And I think they sat on the bottom and all died eventually from lack of air. Um, and I say this simply because as being on a submarine before in a flooding situation, the crew would not have sat still as this submarine was filling with water. Uh, in my opinion, they were all dead before water ever entered that uh, compartment. As you can see here in this diagram of where the uh, skeletons were found, each sitting at their position. They were dead long before water ever started coming into the Hunley. Now, whether that was because of asphyxiation or the shock of the torpedo, um, killing them all instantly, I, I still go with the asphyxiation theory simply because the shock of the torpedo would have affected every member of the crew a little bit different. I don't think it would have killed them all instantly sitting at their position. So... That's my theory as a former submariner. Back to the video. And speaking of who the crew were, this is one of the, in my opinion, the best exhibits in this museum. It's been here for a while. Um, Joseph Ridgway, 
Quartermaster Joseph Ridgeway, Confederate um, uh, Navy, Maryland. Sorry for that break. Um, Boston mate uh, James Wick, Confederate Navy, North Carolina. Crewman Miller. Corporal Carlson. Seaman Frank Collins. C. Simpkins. Arnold Becker. And last but certainly not least, Confederate States of America Medal of Honor, H. L. Hunley the commander of the mission. By the way, the representations of the crew we just looked at were just, they were done by a famous uh, forensic archeologist that specializes in um, using the skull to determine what the person looked like. Here's some of the uh, things that they found. Uh, Hunley is a time capsule. A Union ID tag, um, unexpected find in a secret Confederate submarine, made him think that there may have been a spy aboard, but then they're thinking that Joseph Ridgway had it around his neck as a souvenir. And what would, um, they said that it was, uh, you know, uh, somebody that was killed in the battle that he was involved with. The first skull was recovered right here. The team found the first male cranium that would ultimately locate the full remains of eight crewmen that perished on the submarine. A leather wallet. Tin canteen. see The second phase of the excavation begins. X-rays of a block of sediment contained Lieutenant Dixon's remains reveal a pocket watch. A metal glass binoculars were also found in the hang crank appears. The reason they're saying appears is you, um, most people think that the Hunley was just you know a tube of air with with these eight bodies in it, and it wasn't. It was filled with mud when it was located, so it was a solid. It was just absolutely packed with mud, and the mud had to be removed one layer at a time to determine what happened. Um, so it was almost like, you know, digging up dinosaur bones, but in modern age. Uh, key evidence, the missing viewport. Of the five viewports on the forward conning tower, one is completely missing. A piece of the O-ring that held the viewport in place was found on the floor of the submarine, suggesting the damage occurred early, per, uh, perhaps on the night of the attack. That was that theory that uh, a shot possibly uh, dislodged that viewport and uh, lead, led to the sinking. The gold coin, part of the, one of the biggest legends of the uh, sinking was that Lieutenant Dixon kept a gold coin in his pocket and here is the archeologist actually recovering that coin from the inside of the Hunley. The gold coin, the Hunley Captain Lieutenant Dixon's $20 lucky gold coin is recovered. During the Battle of Shiloh, Dixon was shot in the leg. Fortunately for Dixon, the bullet hit the coin, saving his life. True to the legend, the coin was bent from the impact of the bullet and had been inscribed, My Life Preserver. Maria Jacobs and former Hunley senior archaeologist finds the legendary gold coin. This is a section I was looking for earlier, the timeline of events. 1862, uh, initial tests of the first submarine designed by Hunley, McKintlock and Watson. It's called the Pioneer. 1863, January, American diver, another Hunley predecessor, has its harbor trials. April. Work begins to build the Hunley at Park and Lions Machine Shop in Mobile, Alabama. July, the Hunley is launched for the first time and shows promise during demonstration.
August. The Hunley travels to Charleston to help blockade the stranglings of the city. August 29th, Hunley's first sinking during a test mission. February 17th, the Hunley embarks on her legendary mission and makes world history as the first submarine to sink a combatant. 1995, May 3rd, Hunley discovered by NUMA. A friend of mine there, Ralph Eubanks, and the wet shop dive charters boat in the background. Uh, wet shop is long since closed. Uh, I think that was the fame and fortune that they were seeking. Uh, 2000, uh, August 8th, the raising of the Hunley. I remember it well. And then April 17th, the burial of the final Hunley crew in 2004. Author Clive Cussler finds the Hunley. New York Times bestselling author Clive Cussler doesn't just write about adventures at sea, he lives it. Long interested in maritime history, Kessler founded the National Underwater and Marie Agency NUMA, an organization that searches for some of history's most famous shipwrecks. Finding the world's first combat submarine was a mission right up their alley, much like the Hunley and her mission to make world history. In the 19th century, NUMA didn't get lucky the first time. Kessler and Numa spent over three decades searching for the legendary submarine. On May 3rd, 1995, an expedition including archaeologists Wes Hall, Ralph Wilbanks, and Harry Pocoli fin uh, finally located the vessel. Hunley found what next? Once the Hunley was found, a whole new set of issues emerged. The Registry built as a privateer vessel in support of the Confederacy. Who owns the Hunley? If there are are human remains aboard, how should they be treated? Should the submarine be left at sea as, the, as a war grave? How will she be protected from treasure hunters now that her location is known? So, I think they did the right thing for the year. The Hunley. We're actually going to see the submarine. Um, before we walk up the stairs to look in the tank, we will look at some of the... Uh, the other displays here. Hunley. This is a model of the Hunley on the bottom um, before the lift. You can see they built a very intricate um, cradle around her with soft straps. And I noticed that the Hunley, when she was resting on the bottom, is resting at about a 45 degree angle to starboard. Um, so that that's the way they preserved her for years and years and years. Um, she since she soaked for ten years before they really started um, investigating her, if you will. Um, and one of the things they wanted to do is rotate her over to her port side, forty-five degree angle, so they could see the hidden area. And that was a a huge operation actually is, is picking her up, rotating her, and setting her back down. Uh, and they simply did it by adjusting the tension on those straps that you're seeing there. Here are some actual relics recovered from the Hunley. Dixon's binoculars, pocket knife, vest and trouser buckles. These all came out of the hunter. Suspended buttons, all kinds of stuff. And here's the gold coin Lieutenant Dixon had in his pocket when he was shot in the leg at the Battle of Shiloh. This was discovered in the Hunley, and we earlier talked about that. Some of his uh, jewelry that he kept on the hammer. There it is. The legend becomes reality. She believe in destiny. According to legend, the young woman gave Captain George Dixon a $20 gold coin when he left for war in 1861. 
During the Battle of Shiloh, Dixon was shot. The bullet struck the coin in his trousers, absorbing the impact of the shot and sparing his life. For 137 years, no one knew whether the story was historical fact or romantic tale passed from generation to generation. A legend becomes reality during excavation of the Hunley. A gold coin was discovered lying on Dixon's hip bone. It was warped from the impact of the bullet and traces of lead were discovered on the coin. One side of the $20 coin bears the image of the Lady Liberty and the other side has been partially sanded and inscribed with the following words. Shiloh, April 8, 1862, my life preserver, E.D. Dixon. Forensic scientists who examined the remains of Dixon confirmed that his femur upper leg bone had been injured near the hip. X-rays also revealed traces of lead from the mini ball. The gold coin was indeed his life preserver. Here is an X-ray scan of the Hunley. And we will go up the ladder and take our seat. This is much more organized than it used to be. Focus now. Much better condition than when I saw her for last. She was still totally encrusted. They had started removing hull plates. On a moonlit night in February 1864, the Hunley and her eight-man crew were given the call to see they had waited for and embarked on their ambitious attack. The target was the USS Hesitant, one of the Union's mightiest ships. The Hunley's approach was still, and by the time... And with that, and just a little bit of power remaining in the pocket Osmo, I hope you enjoyed the Hunley Museum.